contact the show, send us an email at liveonfourlegspodcast at gmail.com or get involved in the conversation on social media. Join the Pearl Jam Podcast community group on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Live on Four Legs Pod. We played a little show on the radio last night. I don't know if you, you heard it. <laughs> hey. Anyways, I was just thinking that uh, tonight's, been, tonight's been so much more real. I wish we would have recorded tonight. So anyways... Uh, I've taken my rest now, we're ready to play. And away we go. You're listening to Live on Four Legs, the live Pearl Jam podcast experience featuring... Mr. Stone Gossett! Fucking camera in the truck. everybody now welcome to live on four legs a definitive live pearl jam podcast and we sit here on our 206th episode yeah i don't say that that often but i feel like today gives us a little bit of weight you know makes it feel like we've been here for a long time like well-traveled pearl jam podcast veterans but we are going to do an episode that we actually talked about doing on episode like 70 whenever we did that Berlin show from 1996, because we covered this Berlin show that was broadcast over the radio. And then we find out that the next night is what we're doing today, Hamburg. And Ed says during this show, you guys were much better than the last show. And the Berlin show was fantastic. So what gives? Why was this one better? Why did they not feel the same way they did in Berlin that they did in Hamburg? Those questions can be asked, and also, we'll ask these questions too. We'll ask, what was the scene for Pearl Jam like in Europe back in 1996? Because you have to think, what happened in the States over in 1996? Well, there was a little bit of a dip, because No Code Era didn't get played a lot on radio, and people were dropping out that were in it during Verses and 10 and Vitalogy. They kind of dropped out after that. And I wanted to see the European take because I think it's important to see the European take here. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll hear a little bit from somebody that was at the show. And we'll also get to talk about some, yes, I'm, I'm making good on a tease, everybody. We'll also get to talk about some set list discoveries that we made and changes that we made that we're very excited to have discovered ourselves so we'll spend some time on all that and hopefully you guys will enjoy it the whole way through let's introduce randy sub over here john Farrar over there hello hello what of that to get to first then oh yeah going back i mean this is one that i think i had talked about doing early on and was excited to get to and i'm glad we're finally getting to it i love this era obviously anytime we get to do a jack show it's like um, chomping at the bit to get to it and talk about it and to listen to it. And yeah, that, that Berlin show is just one of the classic all time shows like broadcast on the radio. We did a long episode about it, talked about it a lot, how great it was. And yeah, this one's got a lot to live up to. And I think we're going to get into it, but uh, yeah, I'm excited for this one. I've had this one circled on the list for a long time. Well, if memory is coming back to me here, I think that what you said at the end of that episode was that we better do this one next week. And when you said that, I freaked out because I'm like, no, we have everything scheduled from that point until the end of the year. I'm not making any changes right now. And either I said something and I cut it out of the show or I just thought it and just got kind of just anxious in the moment. But 
yeah, it took us two years. We're finally here. We can finally just do it and enjoy it on its own instead of like living in the shadow, I suppose. But it's been a while since I've listened to the Berlin show. I know you know it off the back of your hand and I know it pretty well. But, you know, I I think that there is, because it's part of the storyline, there is going to have to be some way to compare the two here. And and I don't know if there was any, they, they had done it before, they did it for Soldier Field, they did it for Atlanta, I don't know if there was any, like, real kind of hesitation for playing on the radio at all, but I think what sets this apart is definitely the crowd. And what wasn't reported on Five Horizons is what the audience total was here. What I actually found out now, this is this is funny and this is all coincidental because I started trading some merch stickers from this past tour with some people in Europe, mainly Germany. And one of the guys that I traded with, I just got the sticker from, I believe it was either Berlin or Frankfurt. I can't remember which one it was his, but I got one of the stickers from him today. So I sent him a note thanking him. He sent in a bunch of like stickers and stuff from Hamburg as well. So I'm like, Hey, thanks for, thanks for all the extra stickers. Just to let you know, that's going to be the show we cover this week. And he's like, Oh yeah, yeah, I was at that show. So of course I messaged him when it was like six o'clock on the East coast and probably like, you know, one o'clock or two o'clock out in Germany. So I'm like, Hey, can you, can you tell me a little bit more about the show? And, and he told me a little bit. And, and what I wanted to really know was, was what the audience was like. Cause that seemed to be sort of the breaking point between the two here. And he said that, and this is, his name is Heiko, by the way. So thank you, Heiko, for sharing all this stuff. He said that the capacity was 7,000 and it was definitely sold out to the top. And he said that the sound didn't really amplify there. You couldn't really hear much of what was in Ed's speeches and stuff like that. But I think that that's a good definitive way to sort of say how the band intook some of these crowds because I, you know, you got to think Berlin. I think that that hall that they played in Berlin is significantly, if not at least a little bit bigger than 7,000 people. So they were playing to more. And as you'll see throughout the whole entire show, there are a lot of moments where the crowd takes it upon themselves to participate in this, whether it's clapping, whether it's feeding along with the rhythm, singing along, whatever it is, the crowd takes it all upon themselves. And I think those are the moments that Ed and the band recognize when they're there and they're like, okay, this is something, this is something really special. We have to play up to this and we have to kind of match their enthusiasm, you know? Yeah. And we talked about another great crowd last week in Boston. And this is a similar kind of thing where you can tell that the crowd is elevating the band's performance and they're getting that energy from the crowd and sending it back. And it makes for a special show. Those are my favorite ones to cover. Yeah. And look, out of 96 shows, how often does this one get talked about? It's probably like upper middle of the back. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. And do you think that might be due to Ed's fascination with it during the show and how much he said that he loved this more than Berlin? Probably. And I think even, yeah, the Berlin one being kind of the one that was spotlighted, I think, you know, and this one being just the next night, I think gives it a little more panache or whatever, if you will, gives a little more credit associated with it. So yeah, definitely benefited from that. And they were kind of still, I think, riding off the high of that and like, being on the radio and and having it be a, a big deal and you know you get a little bit of that rubbing off on the show as well i think yeah i can definitely see that i can definitely see that and i think as things evolved and there are some moments in the 1996 u.s part where you can see kind of the ebbs and flows of it all you can see when ed's in a good mood you can see when the band is really feeling it and then there's some weird shows like that fort lauderdale show that was just a little bit strange with lawn chairs and all that and i think that like the european stuff also had a little bit of that too, but I think that also what you have there is you have a crowd of people that might not have had the opportunity to see Pearl Jam during this whole time when they, they've blown up. Because back in 1992, they were there in February and March. And I'm just talking about Europe. It could be Germany. It could be France. It could be England, wherever. They were there in March and February. And then I think they spent a little while there in June. They went back in June and that was kind of, I wouldn't say that they were fully escalated, but they were escalating at the time. They were definitely gaining a lot more momentum than they had in February and March, but they returned in 1993 before verses came out. And I feel like after verses, that's when just the wheels took off. 
and all around the world they became like a global sensation after versus so they didn't play there this was all when you think of that little run they opened up for neil young they opened up for you too and they played a couple shows on their own in sort of smaller venues like brixton academy and places like that but they didn't do kind of a grand scale full-fledged tour in like a headlining tour yeah exactly right so you have to now wait until after the versus era after the vitalogy era and now you're in the midst of no code which as we know on the north american side was not really received very well in the states and the whole radio stations not wanting to play who you are and kind of dumping them after that and what i wanted to know from people in europe was whether or not they felt the same way and they kind of noticed that radio stations and people stopped talking about them. I'm going to read some stuff because I posed this question to Twitter and I asked all of our European friends over on Twitter what they thought was the reception of the record at that time. So let's start with, this is from Daniel Carlton here. This is something we should do more because it involves you guys, of course. A shout out to Daniel because he has a nice little Milo Ackerman avatar on nice. Twitter. So 26 years ago today, as we were recording that, he saw them at Wembley touring for No Code. The fan base was certainly still with them, but I don't recall much media interest at the time or radio play. There was no Euro tour during Yield, and they definitely took a mainstream dip. So, yeah, that's very important when thinking about all this, because as we mentioned, if they had gone to Europe proper in like 1994 or 1995 during the big albums, I think that they would have amassed a much larger fan base than they had at the time. Well, you, you have, have to go you, hot when you're streaking. Yeah, you, and you get in the front of people's memories again because things move so fast. You know, if you're talking about three or four years, things are changing. You know, by 1996, you have Bush and Live and Smashing Pumpkins had become this huge thing. And, like, those bands are out there doing it when they were taking that spot that Pearl Jam didn't want that they backed off of. So, yeah, you run the risk of, like, getting replaced. If they wanted to continue to be that band, you've got to get out there in front of people. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to go back to Kai Hornung, who I believe is one of our patrons. So, hi, Kai. Yeah. And he said, I can only speak for myself. I love Tenon Versus and Vitalogy, so I picked up No Code from the store the day of release and did feel a little bit disappointed when listening to it. Interest of people faded a little bit, but looking at it now, it matured instead of being the soundtrack of teenage angst or people around like their their 20s it just became the more adult centric music and what was going on in their lives who were older than you know their average fan base of course it felt like a more mature record than what was going on in in most rock and roll too so yeah that that all makes sense like i can see that yeah for sure yeah, i mean pearl jam was pushing 30 at this point yeah yeah they're of course. not those angry young men anymore Right. Let's go to Axel Picker here from Twitter as well. He said, I think the dip wasn't as deep here because they weren't as popular here as they were in the U.S. from 1993 until 1995. And this was the point that I was making, mostly because they didn't tour in Europe that much in that period. The No Code Tour was the first proper tour they did in Europe. So that was their first chance to build the popularity through concerts. And then he says, I hope your question is leading to the podcast talking about Hamburg in 1996, which you teased two years ago. We certainly did. We certainly did. And you're right on point. Yeah. To get that kind of idea coming from somebody that lived through it there. It's the whole thing. And I think it translates now that you really can't do anything with your music unless you play live. And it's even more so now because you got to think nobody's going to see you if you're headlining your own show and don't really know you, but they'll be at a festival where their mind is open. They're willing to listen to everything. And they, if they dig you at a festival, then that's where you start to elevate from a lot of bands that are popular right now. That's how they started to, to really formulate. And that's interesting too, because like he's talking about, they were slightly, you know, Pearl Jam's obviously still a big deal all around the world, 1994, 1995, but maybe the hype was slightly less in Europe, so there was less of a drop-off because it, the heights weren't as high. I could see that. Well, from there, I think those are all pretty good ways to depict what this era was. 
And, you know, any way you slice it, whether you liked Pearl Jam in 1996 or not, they still brought it every single night. They were still playing great shows. And this does happen to be one of them. So, yes, the tease is still on for the set list changes. And, and that'll be very soon right off the top. But let's get right into the show. And then you'll hear all about the discoveries and stuff. So they open this show up with Wash. After not playing this at all in the 1995 tour year, Jack got his first and only chances at doing this in just 1996 and never did it in 1998. And this was only five times, this version being the third. And then they would bring it back in 2000 just for one performance, and that was it. What'd you like out of this? I thought that the staccato strumming was very good, but I know that the first thing that you always want to mention whenever there's Jack is what is Jack doing and how does it sound with Jack? So for a a song that he's only played five times, this will be interesting. Yeah, it's a shame that he only played it that amount of times because this song, I think, is kind of tailored to his style where there's lots of open space and there's a really good groove. Like... This is one of those kind of stone like songs like swings and has a really nice bounce to it when it gets going. And I really was paying attention to what kind of fills Jack was doing, what kind of rhythm he was building on this. And yeah, it it did not disappoint. This is a really good Jack performance, I thought, doing some things that you just don't hear the other drummers do on this song. And it was really, really interesting. versions he's probably trying to figure it out in between shows and trying to figure out where his own confidence and his own style fits into that and and yeah i mean i i don't think that there were many bad songs that jack played even their versions of why go which he didn't play much of their versions of leash which he didn't play much of or maybe that he wasn't completely synced with them but those didn't sound bad at all they were just his style and maybe it was less of like oh this doesn't sound good with jack and it was more of we're just over it. We just want to play other stuff. Yeah. So yeah. dump like, it in the past. And this style of song, especially where, you know, a lot of those songs, you know, why go at least those songs don't have space for yep. them. They're, they're very tight and they're very condensed and they kind of are what they are. But I think the ones that he really shines on are the ones where he's got that room to kind of do what he does, which is do those rhythms and, and build up that tension and do the octopus arms things that, that he can do. Yeah, I really like this version of Wash with Jack. We'll kind of go back to that discussion a little bit later with Glorified G, because this was the first time that they had played Glorified G since 1995. It had been a full year, basically, since they had played it, and really didn't get much more play in the Jack era at all. So that should be another interesting conversation sort of tied into what Wash was, too. All right, early songs here. Hail, hail, once... And for any of you looking at live footsteps right now, well, it's changed. We had it changed already. But if you're looking at maybe Five Horizons right now, you might see that it would say, Hail, Hail, Once, Animal, Last Exit. But the correct order is Hail, Hail, Once, Last Exit, Animal. And yeah, I I guess the way we figured it out was that there's a video circulating on youtube for this it's only about a half hour long it has up until i think whipping and after writing down the set after looking at it and hearing last exit i'm like wait a minute this is supposed to be animal is it out of order or something like that and of course you got to go back and look where the camera cuts in this and there were none so what was originally logged as being 
Animal Before Last Exit was a lie for what, 25 years or so? So <laughs> this doesn't ever happen. There's never been any mistakes from any source aside from PearlJam.com, maybe. <laughs> And uh, right. that's not a knock on them, but sometimes things are wrong over there. But yeah, this completely was a different set than what we were looking at. And it, it'll change again later in the encore as well. This is not the first discovery we made. True. It's true. I'm not going to necessarily call it a lie. I think there's just a, a miscommunication somewhere, you know, set list being relayed from Germany. Someone got mixed up and no one ever thought to go back and really dig in and, and listen and change it. But that's one of the fun things about doing this is that we're kind of double checking everyone's work as we go and we're going to get to everything. So by the end of this, it's all going to have been fact checked front to back. So we're, we're going to get an accurate picture once we're all done here. And yeah, this was kind of fun to do. I think I kind of text you like, um, yeah, you might want to you might want to look at that. I think this is different than what it says. So that's a fun little thing. I always like when that comes up when we get to kind of like be the ombudsman of the Pearl Jam set lists. And just so you guys know, it doesn't happen a lot. Not a lot. They right. were everybody from this era, like the Five Horizons. And I don't. You're right. Saying it's a lie is a way to, I guess, play it up a little bit. Yeah. But Five Horizons did their shit and knew their shit. All right, songs here. Hell, hell, I thought was a perfect version for this era. It's such a polished song during 1996, and it just has the original groove to it. Of course, it has Jack, but like everybody seemed to be synced up and and really work off of Wash and getting the energy of Wash out. And this really introduced you to the rest of the set. I thought that Hell, Hell was good, maybe the best from this section. Last exit, notwithstanding. Oh, last exit absolutely burns. But yeah, I agree. I, I love Wash into Hail Hail as a one two punch to start the show. Yeah, I mean, Hail Hail being the number two spot on the record, you know, that's kind of where your brain goes to want to hear it. And especially after something slow like Wash, when it kicks in, it's just like, oh, that's the perfect moment that you want. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, Wash into Hail Hail is very, very good and nearly a flawless version of Hail Hail. Yeah, Ed's got some good screams in this. Like prior to the bridge, he just kind of like lets out that yelp a little bit and they'll keep going. I think that he kind of progresses into it. If it was 1995, he would have been full out from the start and he would have maybe lost a little steam at the end, but that's just what happened in those days. And you didn't care because the first 15 songs all sounded like that and that was good by everybody. But he's a little bit more calculated in where he utilizes that stuff in the 1996 sets. One thing that I think I got to mention though, real quick, Ed shirt in this has, I don't want to be a pirate energy. Did you notice that? Yeah. It's like the Seinfeld. Uh, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. what I'm referencing. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. I don't know if that episode was, was aired yet in 1996. Maybe. Maybe. I would think probably because they, yeah. they stopped in what? 99, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I can, I can see it happening. Look, I thought this whole entire section had stuff to talk about. Like, once there's some great fills from Jack that happen here, the latter part of the first verse, there's one that kind of like catches you by surprise right as they're about to go into the chorus, and that sounded good. And I, I, you don't usually think of once being a standout Jack song or anything like that, but I thought that this one sounded good, and I thought that Ed's little flutter of the, ah, I had something to say. It just had this like, just kind of creepy vibe to it. And I think it kind of mirrored that serial killer aspect that he brings to the song sometimes. I like the I got something to say instead of the I got nothing to say. Right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, Last Exit is still notable, so I think that even with the change that was made and discovery that was made here, the song is definitely, this is a scorcher here. This is one of the best from the early set. Yeah, and like it's weird because, you know, Jack doesn't have the immediacy at the beginning that Dave had on it, but when it kicks in, especially at the ending, I think Jack just takes over and turns it into something really special.
I think there's a lot of aggression. I think that what Jack is bringing into it, I think that kind of invigorated Ed a little bit. And then he's sure. kind of tearing it up on this. And, and Mike's got the cigarette in his mouth during the solo, which is a great visual too. It feels like a lot of the aggression that comes from last exit is being transferred over into animal. Everything kind of picked up from where the last song left off. And of course, that all has to do with setless flow. And of course, when we get that aspect in the set, those are usually some of the best sets to go back to. Animal, great as well. The thing on Animal 2 is Animal is the first time that you really hear the big crowd reaction. You really get a sense for what this crowd is bringing as far as you know energy in the building and That's putting true. on stage. Yeah, and it, yeah. Animal really gets an, a nice reaction from the crowd. And I think Ed kind of takes a moment to speak after, and he's still feeling that off of Animal there. Yeah, absolutely. And the speech goes, good evening, how you doing? Nice to see you again. It's been since 1992. They played there twice in 1992 on both the February March run. I believe that was in March and then in June as well. How you been? You've grown up a little bit since we last saw you. We have, I think. Let's see. Who do we recognize? This kind of feels like Market Hall a while back. It was Jeff's birthday and none of you were there. We have a lot of songs to play and we're glad you made it tonight. And this little section here is going to be dissident into who you are into Corduroy. Yeah, I mean, like, every song has something that you could say about it here. There's, like, a little thing to to add. I thought Dissident had a little personality to it, like the infusion of some energy that maybe didn't feel like a paint-by-numbers version, sometimes going through the motions. I don't know. This this one felt like it had a little bit more confidence, and after verses, you don't necessarily get that all the time at a Dissident from this era. And then look, Who You Are is the song for this era, and then Corduroy is Corduroy. So what from these three was really the one that stand out? To me, overall, it's Corduroy, but what do you got? Uh, Who You Are, for me, I thought, was awesome. I mean, that this is the perfect time for it. You know, you get the the Falling Fast lyric, which is the, the change from the record, the original one there. And I thought that it absolutely soars in the the outro section the solo there i thought did everything you want from a jack song here just really fun to listen to and just stuck out in my headphones as far as like this is one of the performances that sticks out yeah just listening to jack on who you are is just a pleasure Jack, yeah, this is obviously one that he just took to another level that can be seen as a Jack song that he just crushes on. Only been played 44 times, like, that's insane. If it sounds like this, it should have been played 200, 300 times. Like, especially, you know, it made me think of the way we have Josh now adding percussion. We've seen what he can do on, you know, things like WMA. I would love to hear them bring this back on the next tour with some extra percussion from Josh. I think that'd be amazing. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I think that would be an interesting one to test out a little bit. But I think from being played 44 times, I totally understand that because you had this year and there weren't a lot of shows in in general in 1996. And then after Jack left, I don't think they did it at all until 2008. Yeah. So they really, they had a run with it then. 
They played it a little bit more in 2008, but this kind of became like, here's a show, and, and this is like randomly in the middle of the set. Yeah. And, and those this are is like your rare versions ones. too. Like they never, yeah. they never recaptured the energy and the yeah. kind of the soaring quality that this one has, like the tension of it. And when it's good like this, it's one of the best things that they do, I think. But they weren't able to get back to it. But I think maybe with Josh, it could get close again. Corduroy has a lot of amplified aggression in this, and the way that Jacks that tempo that he has, it, it's it's so much different because it feels like Matt is way more straight up, like hi hat snare, hi hat snare, but like Jack is going from snare to tom, like he's more like chopping down a tree while Matt is trying to keep a real tempo. Like every time I hear Jack on this, it just feels like he's just at it at the machine, and he's like working the factory. And the sounds that are coming out of the factory, like if he makes one mistake, the foreman's going to come over and he's going to have his head. So he's focusing and he's clearly in the moment of like, all right, everything has to sound on point. And yeah. it just amplifies this version for sure. Jack is like one of those machines where there's like 25 gears all turning in sync that have to be in perfect time together to work. Right. And on stuff like Who You Are, stuff like the ending of Corduroy, He's got all those gears going and everything is moving and it's propelling everything forward and it sounds amazing. first instance here too if you get the crowd kind of clapping along and becoming a part of the show and sending that energy towards the stage that the band can like ball up and then shoot back with with some really good performances on outro at the end too they kind of extend on that a little bit yeah very very good in all aspects all right so it's elderly woman but is it really Even from the start, like something just felt a little like they weren't interested in it. Either that it felt like somebody was out of sync and it could have just been Ed that was just sort of thinking about it in the moment, but something didn't fit. And he just stops and he's like, all right, this one will be more fun for you all and heads into better man. And first of all, I think it was the correct decision. And it's, 
I do. I I, I do yeah. because I it, it Better Man obviously worked. That's Better Man was a crowd fan. The crowd went crazy for Better Man. I don't know if Elderly Woman had the same Midas touch with a crowd that it does now. And I wonder if that was an original placement there, thinking that it was going to be, all right, after Corduroy, we need to sort of break it up a little bit and then build back. And I wonder if he was just thinking, you know, Corduroy was just so fired up that I don't want there to be a break. It's my only sort of way of trying to get in his mind here. Yeah, maybe it felt like it lagged a little bit because, yeah, Elderly Woman had not yet become the kind of anthem that it is now. And, like, now they can do Corduroy into Small Town, and it's it's a big sing-along, and it can be a big moment. But, yeah, awesome. in, right. in, in 1996, this version didn't have that same kind of grandiose quality that Small Town would take on later. So, yeah, I get it. I think it was a little surprising to go into Better Man instead, because normally when he'll do that, he'll be like, oh, fuck it, and they'll go into something like Whipping which is going to be next like oh let's let's get back with the energy and get going but to go into better man which has that same kind of like slow start which it does get to a nice build and a nice jam with one of the early save it for laters but i was kind of like, oh we're gonna get like a fast one we're gonna go into something blistering but better man in 1996 is not what it would be in 2003 and, and 2006 and this one is still very good oh yeah sure and you know <laughs> whether it go back to the conversation from last week or not, but Elderly Woman definitely into Better Man feels like more of a grander scale build, uh, yeah. especially for the mid set like this. And I think that it's all crowd. It's all crowd singing, responding to it very early. And it feels like that kind of lifted the band. And you do get it saved for later tag here, but it's in its original form. No jam, no breakdown. Mm-hmm. And it's just a little bit of the lyrics at the end. And that's how they end it. I like these early versions too. It doesn't have the theatrical quality that you're talking about, but it just feels like, oh, hey, we just kind of discovered that these are kind of the same, so I'm going to do this. It has kind of a really organic feel to it. Yep. Whipping is another one that gets really aggressive here. Parts that I don't think I've ever heard Ed do before in this song. This is as charged up as I've ever heard. And that's saying a lot for this song that has more than a couple moments where naturally it's supposed to be pretty aggressive. And a good way to kind of get everybody going again after Better Man and the small town tease, if you will. How about whipping into Mankind, though? Love it. Love it. So you're going straight up fast punk rock into catchy little pop rock song sung by Stone. And I actually had some things to talk about with Mankind, if you don't mind, for a second. You know, obviously Stone gets the mic and he's like, yeah, want me to sing one? And then Ed's like, yeah, let me introduce Stone Gossard's vocal debut in Hamburg. Yeah, I know. I'm saying Hamburg and Hamburg. I'm just switching off, you guys. Whatever comes to my mind first. You can count points at home if you want. I enjoyed this performance a whole lot, but I think that the overarching sort of storyline point that I want to talk about is that in 1996, they were taking this song seriously. And there was no, like, let Stone sing yet. And sometimes, although we love it, sometimes that can get very gimmicky. And it can just be like they're only playing it because the crowd is is asking for it. Or it's like one of the celebration nights and everybody's been cheering for it all tour. So they're like, okay, finally we're going to get Stone to do one. And look, I'm not putting those versions down at all. I'm just saying when they actually want to do the song, And this is the the rare period where you can say, like, hey, they wanted to do Mankind. They were actually going out there almost every other night and doing it. And when they have that intention, the song elevates and the song has much more of a purpose. 
and it still has a purpose when it's let stone sing and it's a party and it's a great atmosphere and you get the moment and everything like that but sometimes i i feel like they just kind of laugh it off and whether or not they take it seriously there's a lot like of mistakes that happen yeah in there, it. there's a novelty aspect to it right and I, I feel like when you hear it back then where they're determined on it it's it's just a much better song Sure. Yeah, definitely. And I thought the the solo section, the whole thing with Jack and the quality on this is pretty good. You can hear Jeff a little bit. I thought Jeff and Jack and Stone, the whole rhythm section on that solo part were very, very good. It was a little different than what you're, you're used to hearing. And it really felt like they were pushing it and, and trying to do something cool and trying to add something to the song. Yeah, I think Mankind was one of the highlights of the show. That, of course, is the the classic intro into Evenflow, right? That's going to be <laughs> Mankind, Evenflow, Black, and Jeremy, of course. Of course, that's what they do in Mankind all the time, oh, right? Um, talk about it every week. No, I'm getting tired of it. <laughs> so, Ed, actually, this is something that he did way more often in 2000 than yep. he did in 1996, yep. but he, he teased up the song as this one's called I'm Beginning to See the Light. And I had thought that, they had made reference to that and maybe they do at some point later, but I had thought that they like tagged because I, I know that reference from being a part of Pearl Jam Canon, but I went and I looked it up and it's apparently just a jazz standard made by Ella Fitzgerald that a lots of people have covered over the years. Right. Yeah. Beginning to see the light is velvet underground song. See, that's what, I, okay. It's not, I I'm beginning to that. see the light. It's just beginning to see the light. That's the, uh, one that they've, that's the one that they've tagged okay. before, yeah, from a couple of times in 94, a couple of times in 98, 1000. Yeah, it's just beginning to see the light. Literally, so that that's was, what he was talking about. Yeah, literally, that was my first instinct yeah. to think that that was Velvet yeah. Underground. And then when I looked yeah. at him, like, okay, Ella Fitzgerald, sure, why not? But it could have hey, been something as simple as, like, he saw one of, like, a spotlight came on or something and he just made a reference to it. But yeah, probably probably referring more to the Velvet Underground than the I jazz so. standard. Yep, absolutely, without a doubt. I noticed something out of Jack and Even Flow that I thought was cool. It was kind of on the transition a little bit before the solo, and then kind of happened a little bit into the ending as well. There's this part where you're kind of so used to you know the grind of the song and the way that it just sort of drives the whole way through, and it doesn't really have the sort of stop and go aspect to it. But Jack kind of simplifies it, and he kind of like takes out a beat or so and he opens it up just a little bit to make it sound different and make it sound unique a little bit i thought that that was really good and i don't even know on his versions of even flow that he's done that that often but it was definitely notable yeah i agree and i think sometimes you know me not being a chili peppers fan and kind of blocking that out of my memory most of the time i sometimes forget that that jack irons was the chili peppers drummer early on it's and true. that he can do this kind of like funky like the even flow jam gets a little funky like he gets a little rhythmic and has a little bit of that kind of feel to it and this one was kind of made me remember like oh yeah he was in the chili peppers that actually fits really well with what they're trying to do here so this little section here where you get your big hit 10 songs kind of back to back to back is a little awkward with the flow of the set i thought but they pull it off like obviously the crowd is going to be up for it and pull them through but in 1996, you're not used to getting these, you know, back to back to back like this. It was a little strange. Yeah, no, you're not used to it at all. But I think the the thing that really sticks in my mind, especially after the conversation that we had early before we started talking about the show itself, 
is that they hadn't really been to big places in Europe yet, and really for four years, people might have been waiting for this moment to hear these three songs specifically that Since were the Jeremy video came out. Yeah, that, the Jeremy that video, after that, yeah, the Black Unplugged, Even yeah. Flow, just for being Even Flow. And all three of these songs have excellent reactions to them. And I, I like it's because this was the initial intake of the band was to hear these three songs plus alive. And that's how people fell in love. And they definitely react to it. And there's big clapping section like this crowd. Now you can tell this is a clapping crowd. This isn't a singing crowd as much as it is a clapping crowd. So it's the soccer, the soccer fans, of course, of course, right. And all three of them definitely get good areas where you get to hear the crowd show off and and just become audible. Like think just Jeremy. We we talked about it last week. How crowds can just take Jeremy, whether it's obviously not the hardcore fans' favorite favorite song anymore, but. Every crowd is going to know it. Every crowd is going to be excited to hear it. So when the crowd gets a hold of it, it just becomes this massive moment. Whether you like it or not, you can't really deny it. So I kind of got that sort of same feeling from this crowd. Everybody's juiced during all three of these songs. And I think that maybe it was at this moment where Ed's like, all right, this is something real special that we got in the crowd. Because after sometimes, I think that it's going to be addressed, the whole crowd thing. So... It felt like he was kind of like, okay, you made it through some of the new record. We're going to throw you a bone here and, and pay that off a little bit. And then was sometimes it was like, okay, you had that. Now we're going to pull you back into some of the new stuff. I thought sometimes it was great, had some really good tension and really felt like they were restrained, felt like they were waiting to explode with it, but like not letting it do that. And that, that can be really cool sometimes. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree. Yeah, it's just kind of like taking the blood pressure down a little bit, but yet like still giving the same vibe of tension and giving the yeah, same yeah. like element that the rest of the set has had to just stuff to be excited for. So yeah, great clapping section and, and sometimes as well. And sometimes it's not a song that's been around for the same amount of time that those 10 songs have been out. So they're on top of everything. It doesn't matter. This is after sometimes is going to be what everybody takes out of the show and says, I'm taking a breather. I just want to ask how everybody's doing. We were on the radio last night. Tonight has been much more real. I wish we would have recorded tonight. So there's that. That's the first sort of indication of what he's thinking. And he'll mention the crowd a couple more times here, but you definitely get the sense that this one is way more into the band's wheelhouse. They like to play to more intimate and smaller crowds. So it makes sense out of that. You're going to get river mirror here. And it's another great one with the crowd participation, right from the start, the clapping feeling the really And, with all that they've done in this show, just like the clapping sections and everything like that, it's basically going to happen every other song here on out. But it feels like they definitely, it's not like a premeditated thing or anything like that. It's all natural and it's all stuff that you have to think. Like you don't hear, especially at this time, other crowds react in this matter. So they're all putting it together and creating sort of a new sound for a Pearl Jam crowd, a new vibe with it. And I think that they did a terrific job on that. You know, everybody talks about those South American crowds as being kind of the gold standard for that with the participation and giving that energy to the band. But this is one from way before that that you can say that was kind of the blueprint for that, where if you had this bootleg, you hear this and you're like, oh man, like you can hear this crowd going, they're doing all this different kind of thing. And it, it's one of those things, oh man, I can't wait to do that at our show, you know, it kind of right. builds that community and builds that feeling in the fan base of like, we're part of this now and we can add to the show. It's not just like a thing where you go and you look down on this band and it's a separate, there's like a the wall there, you feel like those walls are breaking down and you can become part of it. And I definitely felt that from some of the shows listening to it as a kid, like couldn't wait to get there and, and be part of that. 
Back to Review Mirror, though, I thought just an incredible version. For the first time since Animal, the crowd just absolutely erupts at the beginning. They could not wait for this. It felt like maybe that was a, a versus thing as well. Extremely fast, but it really gets quiet in the middle. And I think the band realized that they're like, let's give this crowd a moment with the clapping because they know what they've been doing all night. So they bring it down really low and give the crowd a chance to take over with the clapping and then build it back up. It's a fantastic version. Not a lot from Jack here in the bridge. It's mostly just the guitars doing a little bit of a spacey melodic sort of thing. (laughs) And then once they're able to rev back up, like the crowd is just... You, you can tell, like, Ed has some backup singers with this, him and the audience at this one, and it's just revving up for a big finale. Again, even in 1996, there's not a bad version of the River from here. Come on. mentioned that i got shit in alive or your last two in the main set another great clapping section and i got shit even ed misses a lyric here and the crowd is still clapping along with him and i wrote this point for later but i can bring it up now it feels like the crowd is actively rooting for the band and sometimes you get crowds that are almost like waiting to be entertained and just like waiting for passive, the yeah yeah and I, I wouldn't even say passive i would just say like waiting for the band to do something before they can react mm-hmm. and i feel like this crowd is one that's like they're starting the noise they're the ones that are encouraging the band to play well for them and that's easy for the band because the band hears them and the band does what they ask for and they go for it but If it's the other way around, the band doesn't know how the crowd is going to be reacting to I got shit, let's just say, in in another country, in another city. And maybe they have to work harder for it. You can tell that this crowd is the engine that's propelling the show forward. And, you know, if you're in a band, you can sense that on stage. When I was in a band, obviously, we played to a fraction of the crowd that Pearl Jam plays to, an infinitesimal fraction if you will of the crowd that Pearl Jam plays to but I can remember when you know when you've got 20 or 50 people in a basement really feeding off of what you're doing it can really make a difference and those are the best shows and I can only imagine what that's like with 5,000 7,000 10,000 however many people it just makes the performances that much better and you feel like you can do no wrong when the crowds got your back like that and really actively participating I mean this is another really special crowd and I Got Shit is another just spectacular performance. I mean, even without the Cinnamon Girl tag, which is very, very short, he doesn't really play it up like he sometimes will. It's another one that's just kind of organically thrown in, like, hey, I want to do this, and it fits in right here, so I'm just going to go for it. not 
one of those things that you ever think that you would get in a show, and I'm kind of referring to Toronto last month, and I never thought, like, oh, man, one of the things that I'm chasing is the Cinnamon Girl tag. You just don't think of things like that, because it's the added bonus that makes shows like that, when it does happen, so much more memorable than they would have been. If it would have been just I Got Shit played at that show, it would have been fine. It would have been great. But the added factor, and I'm talking again about Toronto, of them adding the Neil story and then adding the tag on where it hadn't been played in 11 years just brings so much to the story of the song, brings so much to the wow factor of the moment and the anticipation for the moment. And yeah, like that's the kind of stuff and not just like the actual Chaser songs itself. Those are the kind of things that make shows stand out. We're ending here with a live. Again, it's Jack Arrow alive, and I think one of the things I, I'm always waiting for with this is just how powerful he's going to get into the end of the song and how much more anthemic this gets with Jack. And I'm always waiting for the Wipeout solo from him, like the Wipeout finish that he does. He didn't quite do it here. He didn't have that full role, but everything else that he does was just leading up to giving Mike sort of a platform to excel and just go off on another killer solo, just fast and blistering out of him. Another one where, like, Jack plays it so much differently than Dave or Matt does, and it just gives it just a different sound. I love these versions because it's always interesting to kind of hear his different take on it. the encore let's pause for station identification and talk about all the things that we do talk about when we pause for our station identification we do have one new patron to thank so we are going to give our thanks to our brand new giggle egg patron they used to call him the tape in high school thank you to pete cassette it's probably Cosset, I'm sure, but yeah, yeah. I couldn't help myself, of course. Uh, I actually was able to reach out to Pete. He, he, uh, nice. he sent us a message back, and he told us what he wanted us to cover for his episode, and I'm liking it because it was a show that happened on my birthday, so I'm excited cool. to do it some point in 2023. Thanks, and hey... Yeah, thank you so much. And if you're one of those people that are just like, hey, I've been listening to this podcast for a while. I have a story that I'd like for them to tell. I want them to cover this show. You don't know how often it happens where people are like, hey, did you cover this one yet? When are you covering this? And because there's so much on our plate and because people are so gracious to be able to help out financially with this podcast, that's one of the perks that we give is for people to donate and get their episode requests. And for a lot of people, they, they absolutely love hearing what we had to say about their shows. Like Joe, you know, sent us from last week, he sent us an email. He's like, wow, that would be like great. Thank you for helping me relive the memories and all that. And yeah, it's, it's, that's, that's all it is. It's just helping you and preserving for all individuals where they went to the show or, or didn't just preserving those memories and keeping them alive. I'm biased, but I sort of think that's what we do best. So if that's one of the things that you also enjoy about this show and want to contribute to, then you can have your own episode. And trust me, if you want to do it, hope you get to do it soon because that 
2023 schedule is going to fill up very, very soon. So if you are a patron right now to the Giga Leg or the Horizon Leg tier and you have an episode that you haven't pitched to us yet, make sure that you get it in. I've been trying to email some people here and there. I have emailed people who haven't heard back from them yet. So I'm going to keep badgering people because I want their stories here. Like that's, hey, stories are good. We want to tell them all. So we want everybody to feel like they're a part of it. But if you haven't joined up and you do want to feel a part of it, then the best way to do it is patreon.com slash live on four legs or go to the Patreon app and search for live on four legs or just go to live on four legs.com and there's buttons all over the place. They're orange. They say become a patron and just follow the directions there and you'll be in. And look, if you wanted to just contribute to the bonus leg tier and just give us a dollar a month and that will get you all the exclusive episodes, that's cool too. We'll accept all of it, and we appreciate all of it. It doesn't matter what tier it's coming from, but we love everybody the same, and we thank everybody the same, and everybody's just, it's a great community to be a part of, and we're just happy to have all these people that want to be a part of it. So any of those tiers, if you wanted to join up, the information's right over there. And for any of you that want to get in touch and let us know what your episode request is going to be, live on four legs podcast at gmail.com. Just reach out and we'll get you in the schedule. That's what we want to do. That's where we want to get it. So anything else to add with that? Yeah, I did want to make note we did release the latest of our late night series on Patreon talking about the Riot Act era on Letterman. Did the I Am Mine and Save You? That was a lot of fun. And also, you know, you were talking there and it made me kind of think of something you could do on on live on fourlegs.com. You know, you can go and search for a show and see if we've covered it on the podcast. This is true. Um, because and and you can listen to it right there. So if there's a show, you know, from from the last few years that oh, you know, I I want to go check out my show on there. And you know, you got all the information there. We've got the concertpedia going from 2014 up until this year. We're gonna keep going with that. And you know, you can look and see, like, hey, have they have they done that show I went to? And if we have, you can listen to the episode right there. This is all true. And you know what else you can do on live on four legs dot com right now is that in the next week or so. And leading, you know, all throughout November, I suppose, we are going to be slowly releasing some of the Concertpedia entries for the 2013 tour. This is a long time yep. coming, guys. Yep. So if that's stuff that you're in, and we'll do them all in chronological order. So Pittsburgh and Buffalo and Worcester will all be first. And if that's something that you're interested in, then it's available right there for you, or it will be. I'm sure we'll have a couple out by this time this episode comes out. So make sure you go and check it out when you're checking out the website because a lot of great participation on that, by the way, from either our patrons or just people that are contributors to our website. So we thank all of them and we hope to be getting more years and more entries out for you as soon as possible. So, all right, back to the rock, not a lot more rock left, but enough, enough a good amount here. Ed comes out, thanks the crowd and says, this song is like a little story. We're going to play this one for you, and then we're going to take requests, which I don't know if he outwardly took any requests because I didn't hear him say, okay, we're going to play that one, but he could have. That could be something that if you were there, if you're Heiko or something like that, then maybe you can share that with us at some point. Off he goes is going to be the first one, though, and the crowd that claps for everything is clapping for everything for sure. got to feel real good when you start up a song especially a new one and the crowd is just as i mentioned before actively rooting for you just such a unique thing to be a part of and this version of off he goes feeds off of that i noticed there was no like killer drive of a solo that mike does at the end there was none of that and it made this version feel a little bit more relatable in a way yeah, very, very good. You no, know, Off He Goes, one of my favorite songs, not just off of No Code. So love that they're giving it a spot here. Give it a kind of a, a spotlighted moment to start the encore. I thought it was a great way to get back into this. And yeah, some of my favorite versions are, are from 96. Yeah, I love this. 
not for you and glorified G are next up. And we did mention glorified G before as being one that Jack didn't really play on a whole lot. They brought it back. This was the first time that they had played it 23 shows. And, and if you remember, if you're a historian like we are, or a prospective historian, as we teach you during these podcasts and stuff like that, then you might know the story about the prior version that they played glorified GI. It was in San Diego in 1995. And it is the version where Ed sings glorified version of, I hate this song. And before getting into glorified G Ed's like, we haven't played this one in a while. And he was like, all right, let's see how it goes. I wonder if glorified G was actually a request. Could be. And I think he even says like, this is our country song. Yes. He does say that. Yeah. Which is a little funny. Cause as he's doing that, I can, hear, right. I, I could totally hear like Toby Keith or Dirks Bentley or someone doing glorified G like completely missing the message of it. And just, you know, treating it like a, like I a got a good song. That was that, that was going through my that was going through my head on this, but not to bury the lead, not for you. I thought was absolutely incredible. The ending of it, you know, we always talk about those Vitalogy songs, your Corroys and Immortalities, which they unfortunately don't play here. Not for you's in that category as well, where Jack just absolutely elevates that ending into something unbelievably good, and even Ed starts kind of vocalizing over it and like does a little improv talks about like oh you know i kind of based off like i can't see i can't see very very cool and again the crowd adding in with the clapping as well i thought not for you was the highlight of the song core Yeah, I like the improv on that too. Yeah, it was a little tough after the, like the I can't sleep part as to what yeah. the whole basis of what he was singing. But obviously, when you know of it now, it's the modern girl tag, and that's pretty much defined and pretty much a staple of it now. But they were trying out different things with it at the time. And I think that everything they did, like this is still in 1996 and even going forward for the, the next couple of years, this would still be a defining song for Pearl Jam, especially of this era. They weren't out of the Ticketmaster thing quite yet, so they were still trying to fight the media and kind of stay out of that spotlight, so Not For You is still very definitive of who they are. So it's still one that they're feeling real good about. It's still the one that I think that a lot of people in the crowd are like, yeah, that's catching on to me because of age and youth and everything like that. It all packages together very, very nicely. The only other thing I had on Glorified G was that it kind of sounded like they changed the lyric to That's Okay, Man, Because I Love Frogs. And I'm thinking yeah, of the band, the frogs. Yeah. That's a frogs reference for yeah. sure. There's a funny moment too. I think stone comes on and goes, I- I'm sure I'll remember the next one. Like he, yeah, right. It, it, in, indicating that he kind of like fucked up on glorified G and, and missed a little bit. Following up on glorified G is daughter. And I, I like this version of daughter a lot. You have two tags coming off of it. And also the song in and of itself, which sometimes gets kind of lost in the discussion. I thought had, a lot of extra bite to it a lot of extra tension to it inspired by the crowd potentially you know of course the crowd showing their stuff on this again and especially in the tag i think that the drive was there to get daughter down really really good of course being another just hit and fan favorite on this i thought that this was an especially very good version of daughter
Do you feel like singing along or something? Sing along. I got I got one picked up. We don't need no education. in the wall is the big sing-along obviously but i i love when they do noise the carpet i love what ed does with it and it's such a different kind of song for what they do i really really like that and that's another one that's kind of of the era you don't get it a lot past 96 98 era but i i really love when when that shows up so that was that was very welcome i thought it added a lot to this performance Yeah, actually, I got a little something to say on Noise of Carpet because that's kind of a song that I don't really know the original of. I don't really know Stereo Lab too much. Very different. Very yeah, different. Yeah, right. Very different. But we've covered it enough times now that without looking at a set list, when they get into it on the tag, I know right away what it is now. And it took a while for me to kind of get there because we don't cover this era every single week. But now that it comes up, I'm like, okay, I can recognize it. I can put two and two together. And it's it's a very, very good tag that is obviously kind of stuck in a time period. Maybe even one of the better ones. If you go off and rank some daughter tags, maybe this can kind of be somewhere in the top five. Uh, yeah, know, fighting for me, for, definitely. Yeah, for sure. So hopefully more people can recognize it after this. We got three more songs left, and Ed asked the crowd, are you up for a few more? Do you understand the question? Are you up for a few more? And then we get into State of Love and Trust and what's going to be Smile afterwards. So here is the other set list discovery that we were teeing up. Originally, well, there's two parts to this. So originally, the sites had Smile to be first, and then State of Love and Trust following that. But also it said... And I'm mainly saying, I think it was live footsteps, because that's usually our first go-to on this. And obviously, we have a speed dial with Dave, so everything gets fixed immediately, and he's double-checking and helping us with stuff. But, you know, it's good to have eyes and ears on for him, too, because he wants to get it right. He wants to get it perfect, too. And he had Smile ending the first encore with State of Love and Trust and Rocket into Free World being in the second encore, which there is no second encore here. It's just running straight through and State of Love and Trust goes into Smile because if you listen to this, there is a little speech before Smile as well. It all makes sense. I think there is a site that actually had it the right way. I believe Two Feet Thick had it the right way. If you look on the Wayback Machine, they did have it the right way. Okay. So, yeah, these things just happen sometimes. And, again, like we're lucky that we're all in the position here to be researching it and fixing whatever we see the mistake. So what about State of Love and Trust? Just the clinic of a solo for Mike. I thought that that was the most impressive part of this song. Like The song is not played at a high speed. It has more of the groove that it did kind of in the mid-90s, but the way that Mike was going off on it was like this big stage song that it's become today. It felt like it was a Mike solo that you would get from 2022, and it was just played to perfection in this.
We haven't talked a lot about Mike on the show, not nearly as much as we did last week. But yeah, this one was one of the first ones where I noticed like, oh yeah, he's over there. He could still bring it on a song like this. Yeah, this is one of the most intense State of Love and Trust solos I've heard in a long time, especially for 1996 when the song was really not in the forefront, even though they did play it a lot. You don't think of, of State of Love and Trust being in 1996, but yeah, oh, he absolutely tore the cover off that thing. Yeah, it's not a song that ever really dipped out of a set list, but you're right. Yeah. Like it just kind of, it can be a transitional thing. It might not be a highlight of a show, but they're still getting it in. And then I think later down the line, when things just start feeling and the nostalgia kicks in and the band starts really kind of finding different gears to to set in during the shows, I think that that's when State of Love and Trust is like, okay, now let's expect it. Now let's hope for it. So. Before Smile, this is kind of the part that I was mentioning here. Ed thanks everybody again and says there's a lot of nice faces, so it makes us want to play the next song for you. And it has a line that says, I miss you already. Have fun with this because we had fun with you tonight. Smile's being played for the fourth time. It was left off all of the U.S. shows and then got played 12 times in total on this Euro run. And, you know, it's interesting. The switcheroo wasn't really advertised at the time I, I guess it was just sort of all right let's let's flop and and go like you know nowadays i think every single time they play smile is like all right i got to introduce you to our new guitarist jeff amen our new bassist stone gossard and kind of make a thing of it and becomes sort of a, a moment in that aspect and not here no this it's just hey let's let's do smile i just think that's interesting in comparison to because we kind of talked about it before with mankind how now they really play up the whole let stone sing thing but back then it's just like let's play these because we got them and let's do them and i'm sure for being the fourth time play to smile they really wanted to still figure out what they had with the switcheroo there and stone playing bass and jeff playing guitar yeah it must have been a really cool visual because you knew you'd never really seen that before at a pearl jam show and it's kind of like oh, okay here we go this is, this is something new but yeah, for being the fourth performance, I thought this was very good. I don't even ever think I've heard Ed sing, you know, during the solo even. It felt like he was really, like, locked in on it and they were feeling in a good mood. Obviously, you know, you're getting near the end of the show. You want to pay off this crowd that, that's done so much. That was cool to hear. Yeah, this was a good version. You're talking about at the end there where he's kind yeah. of doing like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess that's, that's the recorded version on that. Yeah, you don't hear that very often. I thought that Jeff nailed his parts. I really love when Jeff kind of finds his groove and really gets into it because he doesn't get those kind of moments. So Yeah, he kept it simple. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is the kind of show that I think you're leaving the arena that night or, or venue that night saying you're just so glad we experienced that. And I think that's coming from both sides. It's coming from the crowd side. It's coming from the band side. Again, the crowd ate this up. It's a song that's only been played four times. The crowd loved it. Rocking in the Free World is going to end your night. And again, the best clapping crowd on the planet is doing exactly what they do best. It's mainly coming at the bridge to the final verse. It's just tremendous. And then, if you notice, there was a fan that got a hold of the microphone because oh, oh, I noticed. here I, I noticed. it's pretty impossible not to notice. I wish we had video for it to see how it all kind of developed. But yeah, some fans got to sing this. I'll put sing in quotation marks there. It is what it is. But they tried to sing this. Yeah, yeah. This is an interesting, interesting rock in the free world. The crowd's in it early on. And it drops way down. I think everyone even stops playing. And it's just Ed and the clapping for like a measure or two. Maybe Jack is just keeping time a little bit very faintly. But again, they're really giving the crowd a moment on this to like, hey, here's one last chance for you to do your thing. And then the solo part at the end is so weird. Like, I don't know if it was dissonant is the right word, but... Or, not off key necessarily, but just felt kind of off in some way. And like, not like someone's messing up, but they were definitely playing a different thing on it. Did you notice that? Like it felt weird. Eesh, I 
don't know specifically. I think the the thing that I was going to say about Rocket in the Free World for 1996 is it's sort of like State of Love and Trust, what we said about that. You don't think of Rocket in the Free World yeah. as being a 1996 sort of song. You think about it being a 1992, and then, you know, afterwards where it really kind of takes a hold of a set list. You know, the, the, the song that you think about them either closing shows with or being in that cover spot late in the set is usually leaving here at mm-hmm. these shows. So... Yep. Yeah, it's 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 a different aspect, and I I can see them trying different things in this, and I I didn't notice anything in particular with this one, but I'm not surprised just due to the circumstances. Ed's gonna say you guys were brilliant, and thank you all, and they're gonna be big chance at the end of this. The bootleg cuts off, but it feels like the crowd stays for a little extra time and does a couple chants, some soccer chants and stuff like that as the band is leaving the stage. So Stoppage time, if you will. Stoppage time, sure. Well, wouldn't stoppage time be before the encore? Wouldn't that be stoppage time? Uh, they, they do stoppage time at the end, too. Oh, all right. Shows what I know. I've watched like three soccer games <laughs> in my life. All right, let's pick some songs. What did we I like? I think I'm up first this week, right? You are, yes. Yeah, a lot, a lot of good choices here. My number three is going to be Mankind. My number two is Not For You. And my number one is Who You Are. Okay. You know, this is actually, it's weird. This this set, I'm having a tough time actually picking three because I think they're literally, from every single song, there was at least one or two things to love out of all of them. So I'm going to go with number three. I'm going to say the st- Solo on State of Love and Trust was phenomenal. I really liked that. I thought that that was really different, especially for the era. I'm going to say for number two, I'm going to give it to Daughter for number two, because you don't have a lot of versions where you're like, whoa, okay, the actual song itself really stood out here. And then you got a double tag, which is not very common from the time at all. And the crowd is just eating this up just as much as they were eating up anything else in the set. And I think number one is Corduroy for me. I thought that this Corduroy had a lot of drive, had a lot of aggression to it. I love hearing that out of versions from this era. So Corduroy being number one. All right. It's raining time. This one is, is another tough one because the Berlin show is obviously the shadow of that kind of looms over the show and you don't want to like give it the automatic 10 there but you know as we we're talking about it i was kind of thinking about what i was going to do and like at first i'm like well you know it's, it doesn't have a present tense or an in my tree or a red mosquito like berlin did and those were such great moments it felt like it it maybe needed one of those like another big you know no code moment um the fun no code songs yeah yeah but this is still i mean we talked about it last week i bumped last week's show up because of the crowd participation and the crowd on this is phenomenal just all night and so much that we talked about it it talks about it and mentions it i gotta give this one a 10 it's one of the best shows and i could see this being a vault at some point and being a really good show to to check out like so many memorable moments so many great performances highly recommended it's a 10 yeah, I'm not I'm not giving this the perfect score here. This isn't going to go in the Hall of Fame. I'm right in front of it, though. I would love to see it as a vault. I would absolutely love to see it as a vault. I think the band would love to see it as a vault, too. And I've been saying this for years, but travesty that they haven't released anything from 1996. Yeah. yeah. Makes you think, like, what they have back there. But I'm going to give this, I think I'm going to give this a nine and a half. I really enjoyed the listen. I think as it went on, from song to song, just as it continued to progress, you got to hear the crowd get better and better. And I think it's more of like a full show thing than it is an individual performance sort of thing. The show in general stood out and the crowd just did their thing during this. And yeah, I'm, I'm at a nine and a half. I thought this was a very good show and probably one of the best for 1996. Yeah. It's not a Hall of Famer. It's a Hall of it, very, very, very good. Still. Yeah, just the best of the rest that's right in that next section. I I can see that. Look, I didn't give Milwaukee a 10. So if I had to choose between the two, which one I would give a 10, I guess it would be Milwaukee, but I don't want to play that game You didn't give Berlin a 10 either. Technically not, no. (laughs) But honestly, I was was an asshole at the time. (laughs) I I wasn't giving like anything 10s. I I gave out like two 10s. That's it. 
You gave you like, gave out a ten a few weeks later to to Pink Pop, so I don't know. We're gonna have to have to check the tape. Pink Pop was then. Pink Pop two thousand. Oh yeah, I gave that one a ten. It did. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> what uh? What's next week? Next week is don't Chicago. Tell me, don't tell me. Chicago, Chicago, Chicago. Right. All right. Next week is going to be a good one because obviously we have big cities like we did last week with Boston. And this next one is going to be a big city because we are heading to Chicago for the 2003 show. We're going to talk about Ed's grandma, Grandma Vetter. I think you Grandma got, Vetter, you right? Some, uh, you got some Operation Ivy on your mind. Big city, big city. <laughs> no, yeah, that's going to be it's going to be a fun one. We, we haven't come back to 2003 in a while. It feels like so, and a Chicago show as well. So it can be a lot of fun. That's a good set list. I can tee you up on this, you guys. We won't be saying that at all next year. We oh, won't be true. saying, hey, we haven't been at a 2003 show in a while. There will yeah. be 2003. I'm not going to tell you what or I'm not going to tell you how much, but there will be it. You'll get it. And this is also a request from our good friend and patron, Joey Goodsir. So we'll, I'm sure we'll have him on the show. I'm sure he'll have a fan profile for himself. So excited for all that and excited to get to talk to him as always. And that's it. If you liked this episode, if you like this podcast, if you like Pearl Jam, then hopefully we have your support. Just go on to any of your favorite podcast platform and subscribe. Spotify, Apple, they have a rating system. All you got to do is give us five stars and it helps boost the visibility. So when people search for Pearl Jam and podcast, we can come up in the first searches. So that's beneficial to us. And then even more beneficial to us if it does pop up in those searches than if on Apple per se, if you want to leave us a comment there, let us know how we're doing. Let everybody that's been listening know or who's about to listen as to what we're all about. Just leave them a comment. Let them know what you like. Let them know what you love. And that is just the magic of word of mouth. It's a beautiful thing. So help us out. We'll help you back out. If you do that, we will send you a nice little gift. Just let us know it's you. All right, that's all we got for this one. This may be the end. We're here, but not for much longer. And although we may be parting ways, I miss you already. I miss you always. All right, that's it. We'll be in Chicago next week. Not physically, but, you know, in our hearts, I suppose. Until then, listen to some more Boots. I'm sure I'll remember the next one.
back at you. Back at you.